Welcome to the first episode of our season two at Mission Ford. I am super excited about what we've put together for this season and for the conversations we've planned over the next several weeks. I'm also beyond excited about our first guest, who surely sets a high bar for conversations to follow. We've got with us the mother of cause marketing herself, Carol Cohn. Carol leads our field like no other. She literally pioneered the field of social purpose and today is widely recognized as one of the world's foremost social impact experts. Her work has built global movements, garnered hundreds of awards, and most importantly, raised billions of dollars for a variety of worthy causes. In our conversation, we went back to where it all began for Carol, how her values have shaped her career path and the opportunity she sees in the here and now. I am so excited for this conversation and I know you'll love it. So stay tuned and we'll see you on the other side. Carol, as we start in first episode of our second season here at Mission Forward, I want to check in first with you and ask, where are you today? Oh, I'm in Wellington, Florida, which is about 20 miles west of Palm Beach. And so occasionally when I used to fly a year ago, I could land on the tarmac at West Palm Beach and see Air Force One, Mm. but not much longer. That's right. That's Uh right. Well, that's actually the last, the very last trip I took before all of this happened is we went to uh, West Palm Beach for spring training and uh, oh, we hold that memory that. in our mind because that was Absolutely. the last place that we went. Yeah, he loves baseball. Yeah. All right. So I told you a little bit about what we're um, talking about, but this season's topic is centered on this concept of pressing forward. And uh, I've got to imagine you, you have experienced this feeling before. It's this idea that as much as we've got to do, right, we can only control so much. And so we are pressing, pressing, but there are always going to be barriers in our way. And I've been thinking a lot about you as I've been thinking about this, that you have this remarkable job working with causes and organizations, pressing their missions forward, just as you're pressing your own mission forward. But none of it is easy in this global pandemic and disruption that we are living in. So in this year that was 2020, right, no matter what we set out to do, it likely did not turn out the way we had envisioned. So I'm curious what's sticking with you from 2021 or 2020. As you think back to what you were trying to press forward, how'd it go? Did you did you do what you were hoping to do? Or is, is that now starting to um, be part of what your 2021 is going to be? 2020, when the pandemic lockdown hit, Everybody was concerned about what would happen to their cells, their families, their communities, and then their businesses. And um, we had three amazing not-for-profits at the time, and two of them were very event-based. And so they basically just had to cut any external uh, resources, which was sad. But the other one had to press forward because that was points of light. And Points of Light truly is about bringing out the community, the service, and all of us. And so we continue to do some amazing work with them, including a a major national study um, to truly determine, um, you know, what are the opportunities and barriers to service and new descriptions and types of service. And so we got through that. So that was exciting. But once we got to... May or June, all of a sudden, as companies realized that they had to service their employees first, second, and third, then they took their core competencies and they did something that I label generous, um, smart generosity. And they took their competencies such as P&G and they took a lot of their plants and they started making PPE. And they also had had a history of 200 external not-for-profit relationships. So it was easy to, to work with them to get important PPE and other things to local markets. And so we started seeing companies looking that, okay, we're going to survive But how can we continue to press forward to your point? And all of a sudden we got really busy. It's so interesting. It it truly is right in the face of crisis comes innovation. And I think we saw that so much last year. And I'm curious if there are any specific examples that are sticking with you on that point. The world is so interconnected. 
you know, with the, the hubris of the United States. Oh, it's only in Seattle. We have it contained, of course, led by, you know, some large voices. And then as it rippled, it just it just really went across the country, East Coast, West Coast. And then the Midwest said, oh, no, we're not going to get it. And then they had all the events that were unmasked and not social distance. And then the Midwest got hammered and then rural, rural America got hammered. And so we realized, you know, the, 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 the analog that, you know, if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, that you have a tsunami someplace else or however that is stated. Mm-hmm. So the interconnectedness and then a lot of our clients are just saying, let's press forward to make sure that we are going to be helping our communities in the ways that we can. So um, it's, it's had a dramatic impact on our work. It was interesting when, when the pandemic first hit for us, everything for a little bit slowed down and then immediately yeah. kicked back in. Same right. Thing. So we were in crisis comms for a while and then branding projects, strategic planning projects for a while, those were really on hold, right? Folks were unsure if they should be thinking about what their strategic plan is because they didn't know what the future was going to hold. But what are you starting to see now in terms of where the demand is coming, where the need is coming? Um, where do you see people wanting to put their resources? Well, I think that they they want to take their resources that were likely scattershot because we're in the middle of the bell curve of companies either discovering their purpose, like why do I exist? And we do that work. And one of our clients said it was like t- Cone took us as a journey to the center of our soul. So that's purpose work because you truly have to understand the heritage, the values, the competencies, the competitive set, and it's amazing work. And so we love doing that work. We also do social purpose, which we're known for, which I've done for over 35 years. And companies all of a sudden felt we need to do a lot more. And then so how and they came to us and how can we strategize to do something that is authentic? Mm-hmm. and employee engaging and long term and not really understanding best practice and so um we got this business either sole source our clients would go other places or just a recommendation we don't do a lot of pitches we did one highly competitive pitch for an amazing fortune 100 and we didn't even know there were eight other firms but I decided I wanted this company so much because they're an iconic American company that I fielded because our model, we have, you know, partners at the center, very flat model. But then we can expand with either senior consultants who are experts that I have known for decades or members of the Purpose Collaborative, where you are mm-hmm. a member of the Purpose Collaborative. And we fielded a team and I knew it, it was the all star team and we were the last to present. And we had one hour. And at the end of it, they said, thank you very much. They were very engaged. And then I kind of got up from my seat and I went into my, you know, living room and I went, yes, you know, I knew we nailed it. And they called the next day and said, we'd love to work with you. Oh, so, wow. that, so that was really great because, again, the pandemic has allowed in not traveling, you can do a lot more and work will change. Work from home is accepted. And one, it saves money in terms of real estate for companies. It saves tremendous wear and tear on the travel. But then we can expand without real question. Oh, you're using somebody in San Diego. You're using somebody in, you know, um, in, in Paris. It, it doesn't really matter as long as it's seamless to the client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I want to stick on purpose for another minute because you have had an amazing career and you have had an amazing influence um, on purpose, on how we think about purpose, on how companies deploy their purpose. And I want you to tell me a little bit about yours. How did you come into this space? And um, and tell me a little bit about what drives you. Sure. sure. First of all, thank you for those kind words. Um, I have been called many things throughout my career. Um, I was called the mother of cause marketing, cause branding. I think it was fun when the BBC, when I was in Cannes in 2019, they called me the purpose queen. That was kind of fun. (laughs) But when I started doing the work um, in the early days of my firm, in the early 
it was 1983. Hmm. And um, a company came to me. It was a small footwear company called Rockport. And when I was up in Boston, you know, that's the shoe capital in the United States. And their CEO said, I really want to build my company in a special way. We're not known. He didn't have any advertising. They were only 20 million in sales, but they had a very innovative product. It was way ahead of its time. It was a walking shoe. We didn't call shoes walking shoes. Weren't shoes always good for walking? But it had a Nike inner, inner and then it had a street shoe outer. And, you know, I tried to find traditional ways of marketing. They didn't work. They were so almost ugly, but they were great for walking, walking for distance, walking to work, you know, really having, you know, to be utilized. Mm -hmm. And so it was authentic. And in my, I, my superhuman power is connection making. And I grew up, my parents were, my stepfather's a modern artist. My mother was in the theater. I did a little theater. So I'm very, very creative. And I've kept the ability not to have barriers of crazy ideas. And so basically, we decided to embrace walking for health and fitness. We had a fellow who walked around the country for a year. Hmm. And he talked to kids in middle school. And he said, don't smoke, eat properly and walk. And this is pre-internet. So we had to do all of his media. He sent us little ca audio cassettes and we wrote a book. Wow. We did a movie. When he finished, we came over the Brooklyn Bridge. We had um, Health and Human Services, had a proclamation. We had our book ready. And then we created a walking institute. And this all came from my gut that companies needed to have meaning, that they weren't about selling at, they were engaging with. And there were no, there was very, you know, this wasn't called anything in those days. I called it innovative leadership positioning. And then Rockport grew from 20 million to 150 million. We're all excited. America's walking. Walking shoes are a billion dollars at retail. And they were about to go public. And the CEO said, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. He's very nervous because, you know, they're in such demand and he's talking to the banks. And there's a walk in Boston. So we walk for eight miles and talk, walk and talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at the end of it, he said, what should I do? And I said, I think you need to sell the company because Reebok wanted to buy them. And he was just getting, he just, he was just at the, at his wits end. So Reebok bought them. Great day for Rockport, sad day for me. But the good news is that Reebok was then going through, they're very big. They were larger than Nike for a hot minute. And they wanted to do something that would attach them in an authentic way to young people. And they looked at me and said, well, you did the walking thing, figure it out. And so long story short, Reebok became the sponsor of the Amnesty International World Concert Tour with Sting and Peter Gabriel <laughs> and Yusu Endor and Tracy Chapman. But it wasn't called the Reebok Human Rights Now Tour. It was called the Human Rights Now Tour. And they negotiated for $10 million the size of the Reebok logo, which was wow. tiny. Wow. So we had to come up with it. Paul Farman, you know, looked at me and he said, you, you know how to do this. Figure it out. And that's when we created. And this is how we started to codify the connection making. Who's our target? It's a young person. What's of an interest to a young person? And in those days, it was human rights. But you had to really dig deep for it because there were lots of things happening. And so we said, yes, you should sponsor this tour, but we're going to create something that you own. And we created the Reebok Human Rights Awards given to young people under the age of 30 doing nonviolent acts of human rights. You know, old people or dead people got awards, but not young people. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to truly shine a light on these amazing young people around the world. And we did that and it was amazingly successful. And um, Sting and Peter Gabriel, because they loved human rights, they just felt in alignment with Reebok. It was no longer a sponsorship. It was a partnership, yeah. partnership around aligned values. You are so brilliant. I mean, you you say, uh, you know, people say, you just figure it out. And how many of us in our careers have had people <laughs> say that to us, just figure it out. But you, you have this ingenuity and this creativity Thank that's you. just unmatched. So, but I will tell, but I have to tell you, it, it's yeah. not just me. I mean, some of my ideas have just been me, like the Aflac robot, my special Aflac duck, mm -hmm. um, which we created, was my idea. I mean, I had that 
that eureka moment where I was talking to a friend who made social robots for kids with illness. And then he said, well, what are you doing? Who are you pitching? Well, we're, we're pitching Affleck. And boom, over my head, this giant lightning bolt. It just blew up. And I, in my mind, I said, I'm going to make a robot in a duck shape for Affleck to help kids with pediatric cancer. And, and so, but I would say that most of our great ideas were developed by a team because Mm -hmm. great ideas come from anywhere. And and we were very fortunate when I was the cone of cone in the Mm -hmm. eighties and the nineties before I sold to Omnicom, we represented a group in, in Cambridge called Synectics. And they were, I don't know if you ever heard of George Prince, who was the founder of that. They were the founders of creativity. And we got to go through their systems to learn how to recognize that little teeny tiny insight, that brilliant gem of an idea and and how you don't just diss it away. And so that was really, really helpful. So I would say I've had great ideas, but in terms of building Cone and now Carol Cone on purpose and even at Edelman, you have to surround yourself with really great people and you got to trust them and let them go. Yeah, it's true. I started my career working with the X Prize and Peter Diamandis, who founded the X Prize, he used to say, you know, today's brilliant idea was yesterday's crazy idea. You've just got to believe in the idea. (laughs) You've got to believe it and bring it forward. Right. Um, Absolutely. So. So I'm going to switch topics and bring us present day for a minute. So you just helped to pull a list of insights together um, for Fast Company on 2021. And I was so glad to be part of that with you. Thank but you. you have been sharing insights with uh, with quite a few folks recently on what you see coming up for Purpose in 2021. And I'm curious if there are a few that, that resonate and stick out um, that you want to share with us today. Sure. I'd be happy to. First of all, I have to I have to congratulate the Purpose Collaborative because every year we come together and the Purpose Collaborative has over 42 firms now, all with amazing people like you, Carrie, that are founder driven, purpose at the center, very authentic and great quality innovation and delivery. So it's you know, I started five years ago and it's ebbed and flowed, but now it's time is now. So anybody who's listening any of us in the Purpose Collaborative can put together a a team that will blow any other firm away. So every year we do a predictions article. And in this one, um, we we saw six things. At the core, my favorite is always about employees at the center. You know, employees are the engine for change, for growth, for engagement. And so that was one. Stakeholder capitalism is absolutely key. I mean, I can't, say that it came from me. But if you look at Just Capital, one of my favorite NGOs, and you know how they are truly gathering data to show that companies must address all their stakeholders, and it's not shareholders at all. They're only one constituent. So that was one. Um, Another one was that I love to talk about, everybody talks about storytelling. How are you telling your stories? All the ad agencies, how can we do a beautiful, you know, film or this or that? I talk about story doing. And story doing means that you take whatever social issue you're bringing into the company or amplifying and you're doing the work. You're getting the job done. You're touching people. You're um, measuring it. So it's doing it. And once you do the story, then you can tell the story. So I like that one. I do too. Um, and then just accountability. I, I think that there's much more accountability. So that that's another thing. You know, if we'd written it after the sixth, I would have said courage. Mm-hmm. I mean, the companies now post the horrible situation at the Capitol, companies are really stepping up and they're yeah. cutting off their PAC money. They're cutting off their yeah. uh, the PGA saying they're not going to be at Trump uh, Bedminster. Oh, that really upset him. And so companies are really getting strong and courageous about how they have to be. Finally. Yes. And and hopefully it stays that way. One of our core values at Mission Partners is courageous leadership. We try to instill exactly. that in our employees right from the first day. Absolutely. I'm glad to, to have you raise that one. I love a good podcast. I depend on them when I'm taking my morning walk, when I'm on a grocery store run, and when I'm exercising. There are a select few, though, that I live by. 
And one of them is Carol Cohn's Purpose 360 podcast. Purpose 360 is a masterclass in social purpose. And Carol takes on purpose from every angle imaginable, from engaging employees and fostering deeper loyalty to inspiring innovation and increasing market share. If you've not yet given it a listen, check it out at Purpose360Podcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. I want us to maybe come back to where we started, right? So for all the challenges we talked about, there are certainly innovations too, but I'm curious if anything has stuck with you from this last year, any great innovation, any aha and how you do your work, um, anything that you're coming into the year holding on to, to make sure that you can be the best uh, at your, at your work and in your role. Uh, I, th- well, we've always been um, distributed, you know, we, we work from home anywhere. So it wasn't new for us, but because so many others and it's becoming the way to do work, so that you can, and unfortunately, work and then life just to- get totally blended. So you've got mm-hmm. to set up some boundaries. But the fact that we can work with anybody anywhere is great. That That's really, really a, a key takeaway. I think the kind of work we have a client we just got that is going to um, help to close health disparities in um, really underserved, poor um, health deserts. In D.C. and Atlanta and Detroit and New York, um, Newark, and I think I've forgotten one, but they're going to be doing testing for COVID. And this is totally what they have been doing, but they're going to expand it more. They're going to be doing hundreds of testing events to reach thousands and thousands of people who just were left behind. And I think that the gross inequities that we saw um, to people of color and to essential workers, um, I, I truly believe it has indelibly linked into our brains that we must act mm-hmm. going forward. So that's something that I'm, I'm so pleased that companies are rising to the challenge and that they want to do more. And it's they understand, and I always have to tell them, it's okay that you're making money in your business because you need to make a profit to do more in society. It is a, you know, a powerful, positive you know, cycle of goodness. So that's good. There's one thing, though, I do, you, you also want to ask about, is there something that inspires me or yes. wants to happen? Yes. My special Aflac duck, which we created in 2017 and 18 for Aflac, they have the, everybody knows the Aflac duck. You know, he's very funny and he's almost known by 100% in this country. And he goes, Aflac. Mm-hmm. But they don't know that they donated 125 plus million to pediatric cancer. They're very quiet about it. And we were asked to somehow bridge the gap. Long story short, I had that eureka moment and we decided we'd create a social robot in the shape of a duck, but the duck was designed by children. It was, you know, 11 inches tall, soft, roundy, moundy. It purred. Kids want ducks to purr. I don't know. But it also has emojis and ways that a three or four or five or six-year-old can communicate to a nurse or a doctor when they're really not feeling good. They go Mm -hmm. through a thousand days of treatments. So it it, it was wildly successful. You know, it's best in show at CES. There's over 10,000 distributed for free through hospitals to children with cancer. And and when you do something like that, so it won at can at one time magazine, it won best of show at South by. When you do that, you want to do more hmm. because it's creation. It's making sure it gets to market. It's teaching our client that they could truly go f- so far beyond what they had ever dreamed. I want to do that. So here's my ask of your listeners. All right. I want to do that in the field of autism. I know it's a very wide spectrum. And I think I think for children in the middle or early spectrum that we could work with our partner, Sproutel, a terrific young company in, in Providence, Rhode Island, Aaron Horowitz. And cr- do we you know for the Affleck Duck spent a year, at, you know, Aaron spent a year understanding what the children's needs were. And I think that it would be harder in autism, but I believe we could create a social robot. I don't know the shape. It's not going to be a duck, but it could be some new, you know, new idea, new shape, but it could help a child to communicate. Mm -hmm. 
and to be better engaged. And I think that you know, children with autism are brilliant, but they need help. And mm -hmm. so anybody, the challenge is though, there's no company that does a pharmaceutical for autism. It's really leans into the philanthropic, philanthropic right. side. Right. So I, I'm sorry, but anybody I meet, I always tell this story to, because someday I'm going to find somebody who says, I want to do that. Yeah. Well, I may have a few ideas for you on that front. And I suspect that a few people listening might too. So that would we, be will, great. we will pool our resources because I Excellent. think that certainly sounds like a great uh, focus with an amazing potential for impact. And I will let you be the co-mother. Wow, oh, I would love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Carol, thank you so much for your time today. I wish you well and good health. And um, I will continue to watch you and learn from you as I have for so many years. And the same, it's, it's ditto on my end too. So thanks so much for being on your podcast. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say that, that I also have a podcast. It's called Purpose 360. It's a little different. Uh, we work, all, we talk, we interview a lot of guests that are chief communications officers, sustainability officers, authors, pundits, et cetera, in purpose. Um, because for my entire career in doing the work, I also like to educate the world why this is strategic. Yeah. So you're well, doing it, we're doing it. And the more that we do it, the more this will become accepted practice for profits and, you beat and not me. for profits. And congratulations on winning your award from Real Leaders. Thank you. Yeah, that's, you. that's really stunning. And, you know, you're doing great. Our time is now. We are yeah. teachers, we are guides, and we must truly help our profits, our, for, our not-for-profits, our public-private partnerships to really leverage their superhuman powers. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe maybe last word on that. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how um, how last year certainly came with a share of difficulties, as will this year. I'm, I'm certain we're not out of the woods yet, but purpose. Purpose is something that certainly helps us get through. Day to day, I was so glad that I had a purpose and that on so many levels rings true so so thank you for continuing to lead with purpose every day and thank you and also i have to tell your listeners that behind your right shoulder is a picture of ruth bader ginsburg who is one of my heroines and i was just so struck when she passed away and i hope she's looking down and saying i'll help you guys i'll help <laughs> you get back to common decency we'll get there 